So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much indeed for joining us on a rainy Tuesday afternoon. Uh, I hope you are all well and welcome to the Europa Bio EFIB 2021 Vienna Statement afternoon. We are absolutely delighted to have with us some really talented panelists uh, in our meeting today that will follow on from a presentation of our Vienna Statement and various sort of policy based um, statements around that. So I'm going to ask Martina to change the slides. Thank you very much indeed. So I have a little bit of uh, housekeeping for you all today as part of our welcome. My name is Claire Scantleberry. I'm the Director General of Europa Bio, and we are extremely pleased to welcome over 150 participants today to our webinar. And really what we're doing today, it reflects work that we've done throughout 2021 within Europa Bio, with our, within our Industrial Biotechnology Council really looking at our long-term goals for industrial biotech within Europe, and in particular within in Europe, European industrial development, and also the shorter-term action points that we need to undertake right now in order to achieve those longer-term goals. So a lot of the work that we did this year was developing our EFIB Vienna Statement through, as you can tell, our EFIB conference, which took place in October in Vienna, in those crazy days when we could all go out and wear shoes and it was very nice. So we're now all back in our houses again, but hopefully we will be unlocked soon enough to go to EFIB 2022. The webinar today will be recorded so you can catch up on this again and you are very welcome to submit questions through the chat function and we will try to pick out as many as possible through the time that we have in front of us. And after the webinar, you will be able to access the recording for everybody. So if we can have the next slide, thank you very much, Martina. So our agenda today is a really busy one. We start off with a short video message by Virginius Sienkiewicz, uh, the European Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, who in fact cannot be with us today because he is experiencing the magic of biotechnology from a medical perspective by getting his vaccine booster. You will then have a short overview of the EFIB Vienna statement that we developed uh, ready for our conference in Vienna before look, moving to a quick recorded statement um, on the perspectives of the Vienna statement from Simone Schmidbauer uh, from the European Parliament. We will then, within hopefully about 20 minutes, move to a panel discussion where we welcome three very talented individuals who are going to give us an industrial and sort of worldwide perspective on how we need to move in the short and the long term for industrial biotechnology. So, first of all, I'm going to hand back to Martina, who I think is going to roll the tape so that we can have our first video message of the afternoon. Take it away, Martina. Good afternoon, everyone, and many thanks for this invitation. I'd like to use this time to walk you briskly through the European Green Deal and its circular economy action plan. Then we can look more closely at the role of biotechnology inside the green transition. I'm sure you are familiar with the European Green Deal. Its adoption was one of this Commission's first steps and it remains our compass for a green recovery from COVID-19. It's a systemic response to problems like climate change, biodiversity loss and our overconsumption of natural resources. The deal is the framework and we have spent the last two years filling in the details with initiatives like the new climate law, the circular economy action plan, the biodiversity strategy for 2030, and the zero pollution action plan. Our circular economy action plan is especially important for, for industry. It's a plan to reduce our consumption footprint and double Europe's circular material use rate in the coming decade. It's a rolling program and we have a busy agenda ahead. The next major item is a sustainable product policy framework. It's actually the flagship of the new action plan. Our aim is to present a set of landmark proposals in March next year to transform European design. We want a new focus on ensuring that EU products are more circular, more resource efficient and have minimal environmental impacts throughout their life cycle. We'll also propose legislative initiatives to tackle false green claims, increasing trust in the market for green products. You can also expect a new EU strategy for textiles in the spring. We are working to revise other key legislation like the Directive on Packaging and Packaging Waste. And as you know, we are developing the policy framework to address plastics that are compostable, biodegradable and bio-based. 
The Commission is keen to support all promising technologies with help to scale up investments and to create new markets. Horizon Europe, for example, will support the development of indicators and data, novel materials and products, substitution and elimination of hazardous substances based on safe-by-design approach. It's also there to encourage circular business models and new technologies for production or recycling. And that includes, of course, cutting-edge biotechnology in the framework of a sustainable bioeconomy. This sector is already making important contributions to the economy, the environment and society. And in areas like genomics, we are convinced the best is yet to come. It will be crucial to keep building up the scientific knowledge we need, especially in areas like the application of these techniques to microorganisms. In this area, as in so many others, we need to continue the spirit of optimistic cooperation. Your sector has a huge role to play, helping transform our union into a modern, resource-efficient and competitive economy. I wish you every success with today's event. Thank you very much indeed for that first short video. And it was great to say that we're looking at enabling the best to come, because this is incredibly important. Europe has a huge track record in amazing science. And where we are now is really where we have to see that science come into play. And so I'm going to take a few moments now to talk about what we defined as part of our EFIB 2021 Vienna statement. So we want, when we started planning for the EFIB conference um, at the start of this year, we were like, as well as this being a really nice event where industry will come together, discuss with each other, discuss with regulators and policymakers what, where they need to go next, what can we learn from this and share with the rest of the world after the event has finished? And we came up with a concept of having you know, the EFIB Vienna statement this year. And so we looked at we know our long-term goals and we looked at what are the shorter term actions that we need to take. So the first half of the Vienna Statement is, is looking at where we need to go in the short term. And when you look at what we have now, Europe has an amazing challenge ahead of it, uh, some of it which it foresaw and some of it which it did not. So right now we're looking very hard at delivering the Green Deal. This is an absolutely critical thing that we have to achieve, but we also have in the face of the COVID pandemic, we also need to look at the resilience of global supply chains, both as a responsible producer and also as a consumer, so that people anywhere in the world can access the resources they need for a healthy and sustainable life. And we also, on the back of the um, COVID crisis, is we need to build an economic recovery and increase global competitiveness, you know, particularly as we look at the transformation from petrochemical derived processes into more sustainable processes and industrial biotechnology fits right in there. So none of these things happen in isolation. The delivery of the Green Deal both balances to help build the resilience of the supply chain as we bring in novel technologies which themselves enable Europe to become much more competitive. And we have a next generation Europe. We, our children are growing up this is a call to action that we need to heed now. Europe needs to make sure that it stays at the forefront of industrial biotechnology innovation. We're very good at it, and we need to make sure that the economic development linked to research is felt in Europe alongside the employment and the skills development that goes with it. And to do that, we need to be able to translate our innovation strength into large scale applications. This is not about niche manufacturing. This is about large scale production of products and processes that we use every day. And industrial biotechnology sits right at the heart of this. It is an incredibly powerful tool to enable the development of sustainable societies in, in a landscape and a job environment that we all would like to live within. So in transforming manufacturing, we're looking at this is moving beyond the fossil paradigm, moving beyond petrochemical production and into biological production systems. We know that we can do it and we already see it very large scale elsewhere in the world, as well as in Europe. And these production systems, they reduce the use of energy, water, waste and land use, and they enable the much better circularization of materials that we bring into our production processes. And finally, we preserve precious world resources. I want to live in a Europe where I can say, 
you know, I want to reduce exports from the rainforest by 50%. I want to be able to stop deforestation. And you do that by transforming your manufacturing processes to something that preserves biological diversity and not relies upon it for the source of your materials. So the next slide, please, Martina. So when we were developing our Vienna statement, and this was developed throughout the summer and in the early autumn, both with our members at Europa Bio and the participants behind the EFIB conference. And we looked at where we are now. You know, we have eight years until 2030, and we already have some very significant climate goals to reach there. And we have to decide whether we reach them as an innovator or as a customer for somebody else's innovation. And this is a really pivotal point that Europe sits at now. We don't operate in a vacuum. If Europe decides not to do something, it doesn't mean to say the rest of the world is not doing it. So where we look at scaling up a biological manufacturing, decide whether we're going to do that or not, the rest of the world is already doing it. So we need to be at the forefront of that race. And we need to look very much beyond the niche. This is not about exciting, novel, small scale stuff. This is about translating all of our current manufacturer into a much more sustainable basis. And I think most people don't really understand where many of their products come from. And in fact, that we could replace those chemically derived processes with biological processes. There is so much potential here, which we will explore with our panel as well today. So from our Vienna statement, we make three major asks. We ask, one, we need to modernize regulation and policy. We need to enable the impact of the science that we develop in Europe. So this really comes down to the heart of reforming uh, GMO legislation away from a process centric tech platform, which it really was when this was a new process 30 years ago, through to a product based platform so that we can move to completely different manufacturing paradigm, even just to produce the same products. And underpinning that, we need a sustainable and finance and taxonomy framework to allow the sort of 20, 30 year investment decisions and the investment scale that it takes to transform an economy away from petrochemicals into biological production. And hand in hand with this comes our second ask, which is education and awareness. We need to enable everybody around this who is a stakeholder in both helping to deliver these technologies and also consuming the products of these technologies. A positive narrative about how technology such as industrial biotechnology add to our health, the healthiness of our overall environment and lifestyle is absolutely critical. And finally, it always comes back to money. We have to finance this innovation. We need to get past fantastic scientific breakthroughs and make these into scalable products and processes. You know, we can transform European manufacturing using platforms such as industrial biotechnology. And these are the current platforms that we already have in Europe. So we should be leading that transition because it means that we will stay competitively ahead of other areas around the world. So those were really our three asks in our Vienna statement this year. And I could talk all day about this, as you can probably imagine. But what I'm going to do now is hand back to Martina for our second video statement of the afternoon from the European Parliament. So thank you very much, Martina. Ladies and gentlemen, dear speakers, dear colleagues, dear friends of the European Forum for Industrial Biotechnology and the Bioeconomy, dear participants of today's online event. The European Association for Bioindustries is well connected in Brussels and welcomes stakeholders and politicians such as myself to engage in a dialogue on future topics. The bio-based community comes together and this is very important. I am happy and honored to be here with you today. I find today's webinar on the EFEP Vienna Statement 2021 launch of utmost importance and very much at pace with the challenges we face in the times we live. I have read the European Forum for Industrial Biotechnology and the Bioeconomy Statement with great interest. And it is correct. Europe faces the triple challenge of delivering the EU Green Deal, enabling economic recovery and increasing Europe's global competitiveness. My name is Simone Schmidt-Bauer and as Austrian member of the European Parliament, my strong voice speaks for the farmers, 
for the forest owners, the countryside and their good future. You see, I'm a practitioner, I'm a farmer and a forest owner. My family and I we live sustainability on a daily basis, on my fields and in my forest. And on the fields and in the forests of Europe grows what is one of the answers to the challenges we face. Powerful, renewable, bio-based resources. Therefore, I want to pick a specific topic out of the wide-ranged EFIP Vienna Statement of 2021. I want to touch upon enabling impact on modernizing regulation and policy. I want to talk to you about bioeconomy and circularity as part of the solutions towards achieving our Green Deal targets. As practitioner, here lies my passion, my expertise. I want to take the opportunity to share my personal point of view on the matters. To me, a truly sustainable future, Europe starts at the source. Boosting circular economy and fostering sustainable creation and consumption of goods starts with the sustainability of the materials we use at the source. Here lies the key choice we have to make for the future. Do we continue to choose environment and climate harming fossil materials? Or do we switch to sustainable, renewable biomaterials and the technology that comes with it as often and as far as we can? The concepts of bioeconomy and circular economy, certainly flanked and enabled by biotechnology, go hand in hand with the natural, renewable resources. We grow in European forests and on European land. We can improve circularity by the replacement of fossil inputs with renewable, bio-based inputs. I want to bring an example where bioeconomy and biotechnology can play a major role in the circular economy, where we can close regional material cycles and replace imports namely protein feed. Biorefineries or regional oil mills produce GMO-free protein feed as byproduct to green fuel. Like that, we can replace fossil fuels on the one hand and genetically modified soy imports from overseas on the other hand. In addition, nutrients remain available in the region and do not get lost. New biotechnological processes make it even possible to sustainable and efficiently extract proteins, flavors, textile fibers, chemicals, plastics, the list goes on, from various biomass in modern biorefineries. Benefits remain in the region and so do jobs. We have an increasing amount of inputs entering our economy in form of products every single day. And we need to ensure sustainability for these inputs starting at the source. An increasing demand of renewable biomaterials calls for a sustainable management of our natural resources. Therefore, and especially now, as the different committees at the European Parliament start their work on the use Fit for 55 package which addresses bio-based renewables in several files, the EFIP's input is so important. Talking about enabling impact and modernizing regulation and policy. As co-chair of the Working Group for Sustainable Forest Management in the European Parliament, I take note of the Commission's EU forest strategy with concern. A shadow rapporteur for the Red 3 opinion in the Committee on Regional Development, I have doubts on whatever the Commission's proposal gets it right when it comes to the use of sustainable, sourced, renewable materials to reach the EU Green Deal ambitions. We must talk openly about unsuitable, contradicting and restrictive ideas for the use of sustainable, sourced, renewable materials and what an ideological way would mean for the use of bioeconomy and biotechnology efforts. I once heard an expert say, 
bioeconomy is more than biotechnology and vice versa. This holds true. Biotechnology is a driving force in bioeconomy and vice versa. It overlaps, it interacts, it depends on each other for sustainable future solutions. And we need to draw more attention to this and truly enable its impact. If we take the EU Green Deal seriously, fossil time must come to an end at last. I say, let bioeconomy, circular economy and biotechnology lead the way towards a real transition to a greener Europe. It is our duty to use the EU's great potential to tackle challenges of delivering the EU Green Deal, enabling economic recovery and increasing Europe's competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And that was a very considered and thoughtful uh, webinar addition to our meeting this afternoon. So I think that brings us very nicely to starting the panel discussion for the afternoon. And I'm going to invite our three panelists to reveal themselves uh, at the top of our screen. That's lovely. And so our panelists today come from a mixture of industry and sort of wider economic organization forums, and they all have very different approaches to their own priorities and the methods in which industrial biotechnology has to be viewed. And this is not just from a technical perspective, it's, into a, huge, it's a global environmental perspective. Science does not exist in a vacuum, it's within many contexts. Um, and very closely linked to societal development. So we have our panelists that reflect priorities for European industrial and global ecosystem development. We're going to discuss how industrial biotechnology will deliver its maximum economic, society, societal and sustainability impact and the pathway that we need to take to achieve that. So I'm going to introduce our panelists one at a time and ask them to make a short introduction about themselves and what they see as the a key priority to achieve linked to our work with the Vienna Statement. So I will start with Elke. Do you want to kickstart us for the panelists, Elke? Yes, sure. Um, so my name is Elke Duvenich. I'm working for BSF as a senior expert biotechnology for global regulatory and government relation, uh, nutrition and health at yeah, BSF. So I'm passionate for innovation and sustainability and I believe in the enabling power of biotechnology. And I have to uh, add here genetically optimized biotechnology. So nothing against GMO. I'm very much in favor of GMOs um, to tackle really the global challenges, both in One Health as well as in the protection of climate, environment and biodiversity. Working as BSF, I think I, I don't have to explain. It's a multi multinational chemical company. We are headquartered in Germany. We have a broad portfolio of biotech products, uh, really since the start, uh, producing vitamins, riboflavin, by a genetically with the help of genetically modified organisms. And uh, we are doing enzymes, aroma chemicals, cosmetic ingredients, plant protection products, and chemical compounds by biotech. And uh, we are aiming to double uh, our sales with circular products to 17 billion by the year 2030. And biotech will play a very significant role here. And my key priority is linked to the Vienna statement. <laughs> not surprisingly, is a green transformation of the chemical industry. And uh, Claire, I'm not sure if I should extend right now or just leave it like this. Yeah, please so add, add a little bit more because I think this really okay. underpins the discussion that we have. Okay, because um, because uh, I see a strong push for for um, in the renewable based portfolio in the chemical industry in general, and there will be a strong growth of alternative renewable feedstocks for supporting the green transformation. But this is for sure, and Claire, you mentioned already a huge scaling up of industrial biotech products and processes as well, both biocatalysis by enzymes using enzymes, but as well fermentation using using genetically modified organisms. And industrial biotech is so powerful because it allows the use of renewable raw materials in a vast diversity of products and chemical intermediates, not only food and feed. It's increasing the productivity and the efficiency of the process. So it's highly sustainable by that. Um, it's reducing the hazardous, uh, the use of hazardous chemicals and high en energy intensive processes. It improves the product quality and effectiveness. And by this overall, it's an enabler of the Green Deal. 
And uh, but what is clear as well, and we will cover it more more in details later, the transformation will not happen overnight. Uh, because right now we are we are really still doing a lot with fossil based chemistry and this is good because it gives us it gives us uh, it gives us uh, salaries and the, and the products we need right now but we have to prepare for the future and to successfully realize this industrial transformation of the chemical sector and at the same time globally remain competitive we have to remove and the policies have to remove the hurdles for renewable feedstocks for modern biotech like genome editing and for renewable energy supply. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Elke. And I love the comment that you made about the fact that you aim to increase your product value in from circular processes to 17 billion euros. You know, this shows that this is not small beans economically. Mm -hmm. This is big beans economically. So this is not niche fashionable manufacture. This is large scale global manufacture. Exactly. That's great. So I'm going to go to my next uh, panelist today. Jim, who's joined us from the OECD, and to really talk about what brings him into this discussion. Okay, uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Jim Philp. I joined the OECD in 2011. Uh, we are headquartered in Paris, and we're an international organization uh, that deals with all sorts of economic issues. My small part of the house is in a working party called BNCT, Bio, Nano and Converging Technologies. So my background is in fact as a microbiologist, but I spent a significant amount of that career in deepest, darkest crude oil in Saudi Arabia. Uh, however, we did work on biotechnology within that company. So coming back in 2011, I was tasked with uh, areas such as in industrial biotech and synthetic biology. And, and Claire, when you talk about an area that we that I, I'm interested in, virtually all of that work since 2011 has at least touched on the issue of scale up, and and I, and I have a colleague, in fact, a Scottish colleague, who summed this up very nicely for us, and he's a chemist, and he said in chemistry the feedstocks are concentrated, the reactions are fast, and the products are concentrated, but in biology it's exactly the opposite. The feedstocks are dilute. The actions are slow and the products are dilute, which means there is significant expense to uh, purify those products, which is completely separate from the, from the fermentation process. Now, that's all very well when things are niche, as came up in the, the Vienna statement. But as we're talking about today, as this becomes full blown manufacturing, then that becomes an enormous issue. And there are, I've, because we work in policy, I've identified various reasons uh, why scale up is going to be is a problem, but let me turn to to me the most important part, and I and I have this in front of me. I can quote it from the Vienna Statement: A circular bioeconomy meets industrial priorities to deliver efficiency, competitiveness, and sustainability. The second sentence here is the key for me, and it's very intelligently worded. It must move from niche to large scale biological manufacturing systems across sectors integrated into the process industry, manufacturing and recycling. And the very word recycling there brings in the circular aspects of this. So it, it, I, I guess this stage clear, that's probably enough. You don't want me to go into these reasons just now. Maybe that comes out later. No, that's absolutely fine. Because um, we have got lots of questions to get to, which is really great. So I'm going to invite Stefan, our third panelist here, to introduce himself briefly and, and name some of his priorities linked to the Vienna Statement. Yeah, so <clears throat> my name is Stefan Buchwald. I'm chemist by education. Um, I'm working for Avonic Industries, a chemical company, a global company, but um, headquartered in Germany. I've been working for the company or its predecessor company since 28 years spending most of my life really in research, development and innovation. For the last 20 years, I've been heavily involved with uh, biotechnology. Today, I'm heading um, the research and development department for our division nutrition and care, uh, which is, so to speak, the home of biotechnology within our company. Yeah, so far, perhaps with respect to me and coming to the Vienna statement, I think Jim already touched upon a very important point. Yeah. We have to scale and Jim mentioned some of the technical challenges. 
these diluted solutions, and I'm very familiar with this. Um, but there are also other uh, challenges. I mean, we have to have really a public acceptance for this whole transformation process. Um, and the first plans for reasons which in part have been mentioned by Jim here yeah, will not be so profitable. Yeah. So, I mean, the question is, will there be some kinds of incentives? These may be subsidies, not necessarily. Yeah. But what we also need is low cost energy. Yeah. Because again, referring to what Jim has said, um, um, the products we are gaining from fermentation processes are the dilute. Yeah? We have to then separate the, the product, which often is an energy intensive process. And this is only sustainable if you have enough renewable energy at the reasonable cost available. Yeah? And this will be key also for competitiveness because we have to bring this together, yeah? sustainability and competitiveness. Otherwise we will not be successful. CO2 pricing clearly is something which could help here in this context, yeah? but also there, of course, preferably on a global scale yeah, um, to um, yeah, keep up our uh, um, competitiveness. And we need also um, a reliable regulative framework yeah, when we want to invest money. Yeah? But delivering this, I mean, this is clearly a task for politics, yeah, but I also we also see the challenge for politics because the world nowadays is very dynamic. Yeah? There are many surprising things going on. Yeah? So this is also something which we have to, to reconcile. Um, and furthermore, um, talking about the scaling, yeah, bringing biotechnology to scale, it's not just yeah, bringing it from a small scale to a big scale. It's not just going from an Eppendorf yeah, to a big uh, technical plant. It's often also about whole value chains. Yeah? because the products are not exactly the same as we have seen before. They might be somewhat different. We need different feedstock. Yeah? And we are partially investing into plants for products yeah, we, where we already have plants available, yeah? which are still running, which are still profitable. Yeah? And this is something you normally wouldn't do. We yeah? are replacing a plant which is still working and profitable. Yeah? So we need additional capital. Yeah? And uh, this capital has to be made available. Um, therefore, low interest rate, of course, is very helpful. We are seeing this today. But on the other hand, we also don't want to have inflation. Yeah? Also, this we have to reconcile. So there are many um, challenges. Um, and um, yeah, going now from from this more technical from technical value chain. Also, we have to look at it from from the point of acceptance because, and we have to think about all the stakeholders of the value chain. Because the transformation will only be successful if they all accept the change, yeah? if they all play their role. And just to give you one example, we have a joint venture with GSM called Vera Maris, and there we are producing algae oil. Now, what is algae oil good for? Yeah? It's being used in, in aquaculture, yeah? and there we are replacing fish oil. Yeah? And I think you are all aware that uh, the oceans are overfished, yeah. So we, we have to do something about this, and aquaculture is the solution. But today, aquaculture still needs a lot of fish to feed the fish. Salmon, for example, yeah, uh, um, is, is a fish which lives on other fishes, yeah. And also, these other fishes they don't produce um, the polyunsaturated fatty, acid, fatty acids, which are so valuable for our human nutrition. But these are being produced by micro microalgae, and we are now producing those in big fermenters in the US. And uh, introducing those to the market um, is not so easy because the end consumer isn't aware of these uh, uh, connections. Yeah? He only sees the salmon and looks at the price, basically. Yeah? Um, and when we want to sell our algae oil to the big aquaculture companies, they only have to pay additional money yeah? because just uh, harvesting the, 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 other, the sardines from the ocean is cheaper. Yeah? And therefore, really transforming you know, the value chain is, is a challenge. Um, but I mean, there, there is some hope, I would say, and this is something which we see more and more. In the past, which I recall, I mean, when I, to take another example, when I went to the grocery store and I bought a steak, I just want to have a steak. And nowadays, people who are going there, they want to have a steak, but they're asking, well, what kind of cow is it from? Yeah? Where did the cow live? Yeah. What was it fed with? Yeah. Was the cow happy? Yeah. Animal welfare. Yeah. 
And um, more and more, all this information is available, which wasn't available in the past. And there are modern technologies like epigenetics, which, which help to really prove you know, this value chain. Um, there are also other uh, uh, tools like, like apps. Um, there is this app, I don't know whether you have it, code check, yeah, and then if you go to the supermarket and you buy a bottle of shampoo, yeah, you just scanning the code and you will get environmental information, yeah, and uh, how hazardous the, ing the ingredients are. Uh, and I think this is really our uh, our industry. And here, really, all the stakeholders have to work together, public, yeah, plus politics, plus industry. No, that's great. And I think it's a really important reminder that science doesn't deliver in isolation. An elegant scientific advance is not a product until it actually reaches its destination. You know, we're talking a lot about mRNA this year, but mRNA was, mm -hmm. you know, it was identified over 20 years ago and been slowly, slowly developed until there became an urgent need for products now. So it doesn't happen overnight. And it took a huge number of things to make that happen. And it's the same with a lot of the technologies behind industrial biotech as well. It requires everything to move to enable these sciences to be delivered. But, but staying with you, uh, Stefan, where do, where do you see the highest potential for innovative technologies and industrial biotechnology you know, to, to help support sustainability of industry and society now? Um, yeah, I think I already brought uh, the important example of mRNA technology. Yeah? And when we are talking about sustainability, it's also interesting that often we, we really focus on the ecological part of, of the whole story. Yeah? Um, I still record when we said sustainability is people plan profit. Yeah? We have to think about all these three aspects. And uh, with respect to the people aspect, I would say that uh, really the drugs, the mRNA drugs, for example, are very crucial um, uh, example where everybody's aware of and where you clearly see the contribution of biotechnology and where you see the, the advancements. So, um, but I mean, the story goes back. I mean, we also had monoclonal antibodies. Not everybody's in touch with, with monoclonal antibodies, but a lot of people who have cancer, yeah, uh, for them it's it's really important, yeah, that these technologies are available these days. Also insulin, yeah, uh, coming from fermentation. And there, I mean, there also in the beginning, there was a lot of resistance because people didn't see the connections and because they, due, perhaps due to the fact because they were not really scientifically educated, they had a, a, a perception of risk reward, which I would say didn't really reflect uh, the, the actual situation. Um, so clearly here in the medical field, I think uh, innovation will go on yeah, and will contribute to a sustainable world. But also, and this is more and more related to, to, to healthcare, is nutrition. Yeah? We are more and more aware of, of about what we are eating. Yeah? Many young people are really going for, for a healthy lifestyle. Um, for a mixture of health reasons, but also environmental reasons, yeah, they're going from, away from meat. Yeah, they're living more on a vegan, vegetarian, or vegan diet. So alternative protein is very important these days. Um, for those people who still eat meat, yeah, then it's also very important. And this is another example, which many people in the public are not really aware of. Yeah, it's very important that we feed our. Uh, um, that we feed the, 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 the livestock in a very sustainable way. Yeah? And there are all the products like amino acids are contributing, uh, but I think all of you are aware also of the problem we are having with supplying um, antibiotics yeah? uh, uh, in, in animal feeding. And these are more and more being replaced by probiotics that in combination with other components. Yeah? And there, clearly, we have to rely on biotechnology, and biotechnology uh, gives major contributions. With respect to human nutrition, alternative protein, also, for example, there is a lot of talk and there are interesting developments in insect biotechnology, yeah? growing insect larvae yeah, for nutrition, which really can, can live on food waste. Yeah? But there is also a lot of the a lot of regulation which hinders yeah, these larvae um, um, to be used for, for animal feed, for, for example. Yeah. And um, then we also have the point of cultured meat, which is a very hot topic, I would say. Yeah. 
I don't see it really replacing classical meat on scale short term, but it's a very interesting long term development. Yeah. In the field of personal care, we just recently, or not, meanwhile, two years ago, um, we, we introduced to the market a new biosurfactant. Yeah, this biosurfactant is not just produced from local feedstock, yeah, it's produced by biotechnology, it's 100% and very quickly biodegradable, and it's a biosurfactant, and it's also called biosurfactant because this molecule exists in nature. Yeah, it's, it's nature identical, yeah, you find it in nature. And here, for example, we are in the process really of scaling it. Yeah? And as Jim mentioned, yeah, the, really the downstream processing, the, the isolation of this product is a challenge, yeah, but uh, I think we managed this. And uh, last but not least, um, then we also have the biopolymers yeah, for all kinds of applications. Also here, for example, I mean, when we talk about, uh, bio, uh, about microplastics, yeah, then a lot of people are also thinking about cosmetics, although we meanwhile know that this is not the major source for bioplastics in, uh, uh, microplastics in the environment. But we have water-soluble polymers in, in, the, uh, in, in shower gel, for example, in shampoo. Yeah? Uh, this is not really critical for the environment up to now, but we don't just want, we don't want to have it in the environment anymore. And therefore, we have to look for alternative solutions, bio-based, and biodegradable, yeah? And having something which is bio-based and biodegradable, we have this biocircularity, yeah? And, um, and I think this is what we have to go for. No, that's great. I mean, we, I'm always amazed at how complex production of materials is. So my original background is in agriculture. So I know the complexity of the food production process. And it, it's very simplified when you look at the product in the supermarket. But the pathway behind that biotechnology can play a, play a role in virtually every single step to reduce the environmental impact and the circularity of that process as a whole. So I'm always amazed to hear about how you can engage biotechnology to reduce the impact of agriculture. I think I wanted to go back over to, oh, Jim's holding his finger up, I think. Hi, can I, can I come in there on everything that all the products that Stefan has mentioned? Um, I, I'd like to mention an enabling technology of which we've been looking at over the past two or three years called the biofoundry. Now, mm -hmm. Stefan, almost all of those things you mentioned, especially if they're, they're made in microbes, um, the biofoundry we've been calling the missing link because most of the organisms which are in biorefineries bio have never actually been optimized for the job they're expected to do. So that the traits which make the actual product are far from the end of the story in an optimized microorganism. And if you think about it, as I have thought often, is that we go through a bachelor's degree for four years, a master's for one or two years, a PhD for three years, and then what we do with our careers for a long time is use a pipette. Now, mm -hmm. all this brain power in science, which is locked up in using pipettes when robots can do that work. So that's one of the things we've been saying at the Biofoundry. You don't do one factor at a time in an experiment, you do multiple factors and you do this optimization much more quickly. And that's, I think, one of the things I see is a, is a future enabling technology is to make that communication between the biofoundries and the biorefineries. And indeed, if the organism is still not completely um, optimized, the biorefinery gets back in touch with the biofoundry and they do ping pong mm -hmm. until the organism is right for the job. Mm -hmm. No, yep. it's amazing. It's 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 constantly moving forward as to how it can be applied. But I want to go back to Elka now and look at some of your um, priorities here, because when we were discussing the preparation of this webinar, you talked about, you know, obviously the regulatory side is so critical to enable this to happen. Without the right regulatory framework, nothing progresses, regardless of how great the science is. And you talked about a regulatory sand pit to help develop up products and processes that can pass through regulatory requirements. Could you explain a little bit more about that and how it might help other companies, particularly small companies, to you know, translate their innovations through to market? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced Europe needs to balance innovation and regulation in a new way now. And we must invest in biotechnology, we must invest in fermentation capacity, and we have must in digitalization and blockchain. I think this is all 
brings it together because it's it's really we are stuck and, and it's not only small companies as big companies as well stuck so often in the system we know we have wonderful products and that by the way was the reason why i started with regulatory or advocacy because i was uh, head of research in, in plant biotech and didn't see our our products moving on the market uh, so i i cared for them for myself uh, for this but it's really again it's it's really you have great products you know that it has a big impact on 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 positive impact on environment and and the process but you don't get it on the market or not fast enough so for me the idea was this and not my idea but really to hand hands regulatory sandboxing here is that uh, what we have seen and this is a great example with a with a vaccine i mean you you mentioned it clear it was like 20 years of course the technology was known but then we had an urgent need and uh, the vaccines were brought on the market. I mean, technically wise, this was um, just in a few weeks, two months, they were ready, but then and the process was very fast as well. And for me, this is no reason not to do it again, to really, I mean, it's not about sacrificing safety or anything, but really to go hand in hand with the regulatory bodies, with the authorities. If you have a result, show it to the authorities, they view it and then, you are very fast with getting a product on the market. And this kind of spirit, what we had, we had showed for vaccines um, now, we have to do it again for all kinds of products which really make a difference. So my, my idea, or the idea, <laughs> is to really have European innovation sandboxes jointly set up by science, business and politics. And this could speed up the transformation process by far. And I especially see it with small, medium enterprises. They often have wonderful ideas and they're really, they want to be fast on the market and of course the investors are really expecting that they are fast on the market and then uh, if a regulatory person or legal person comes into the picture it really slows down the entire process so i think it's it's really um the the challenge is that you have to really start very early to think about regulatory and legal requirements when you start with your strain in the beginning, when you choose the production strain even, even earlier. <laughs> so it's really, it's, it's, you have to respect Nagoya protocols, you have to respect uh, all kinds of, of property rights, you have to respect which kind of technique to use, which kind of markers you use, which kind of techniques and so on, and, and genes you're using. So it's really like a complex process. And um, I think with this uh, regulatory sandboxing, speeding up the process, make it very transparent and easy in a way with digitalization as well, then you really could help a lot of small companies to get their products really on the market and don't disappoint the investors because it's stuck in the system for years. No, I think there's, there's, a, there's a number of really great points in there because obviously what we saw with the vaccine development, obviously we'd probably let our regulators sleep a little bit more than the vaccine reg than the uh, health regulators did in the first days of COVID. But you saw a huge amount of exchange of information and knowledge between regulatory territories as well. So where you've got a new technology pushing forward quickly, you don't do the whole thing twice. You're sharing, non you're sharing knowledge. And when you've got small companies in particular coming with a particularly perhaps a disruptive technology that may be new for the regulators as well, it's it can really slow it down because obviously the regulator has to understand what this new technology is doing and how it might re be reflected in existing frameworks. So yeah, the sandboxing idea is is a great one, and we see a huge amount of willingness towards this and enthusiasm towards this. I think it's the bottleneck is not the ability to do it. The bottleneck is you know setting things up and funding them so that they can be done. But. Uh, and Elke, I mean, one thing you'll know better than me is that the United States has been very loud and clear that they are going to be modify, modernize the uh, biotechn biotechnology regulation. And that's a message for Europe, because if we don't and they do, then we're left behind. Yeah, we are. Yeah, <laughs> we are pushing <laughs> for that. And the EU Commission is, is working on it as well. Um, they are they are doing it now for plants, but we remind them that microorganisms are there as well, and they have a big role to play, that they don't uh, keep forgetting us. And um, yeah, hurt very, very, very <laughs> much so. And when we look at the role that microorganisms have to play into the scale of transformation that is possible with that, it's a it's a it's a no brainer to can progress this quickly because it can have a very short term you know, extremely precautionary approach applied to existing manufacturing processes. 
But I'll come back to Jim now, because we were going to say, you know, the role of the OECD when it, when it comes to innovative technologies emerging, how does the OECD help to ensure their global uptake? Well, I mean, we're, we're in a kind of privileged position uh, in some ways, I guess, uh, even compared to other, uh, let me call them multinational or uh, international organizations. And we are relatively small, but I think our greatest strength as an organization is we have the power to convene. And, and, uh, th and moreover, this is way beyond Europe because we have Korea, Japan, Australia, United States, Canada, some of the, the, the biggest economies in the world that we can convene people. Um, and we, when I when I say convene, it, it, we do we convene all the way to heads of state, but that's not what affects me. What affects me is the ability to convene high level civil servants of, uh, who are in ministries of really big importance to what we're talking about. For example, I my previous one of my previous U.S. delegates was from the USDA, and he knew the Buyer Preferred program inside out. And right now, I have two delegates from the the Department of Energy, top people. And that's the, one of the things we can do very well is to bring these people to the table. And every two years, we discuss what the priorities are for the next two year period. So we like to think that it's not to do with us as Secretariat. We like to think that by bringing these people to the table, we found exactly what has to be done, working that for two years, we produce a policy paper at the end of that, which can be distributed very widely, but it doesn't end there, of course, because as anybody who's in this business knows, unlike in a scientific paper where you write it once and you put it out there and that's that, this message has to be repeated over and over and over again to politicians and to the public. And that's something we also are able to do as an organization. Uh, so it just doesn't end when we, when we write our, uh, our, our policy papers. And another aspect about this convening power, and one that's very pertinent to the discussion just now, is we've we've taken a look at the biomass sustainability, for example, for a good number of years. And I know that the commission is in this in, in this now, is that we can convene meetings sponsored by various different countries to look at these metrics. Because one of the things that perplexes governments is. You're talking about this bioeconomy, and we don't know how to measure it. We haven't uh, figured out yet what those metrics are. So that's that's been a, a strength for us as well. And I don't I don't want to mention the country, but um, very often we don't hear about the good work we're doing. Countries just don't tell us if it's if they've liked or, or what they've done or, or not. Um, but one country representative personally said to me that his country had adopted. This, the current regime looking towards uh, 2050 and carbon neutrality based on some of the work we had done. And that was a game changer for me in here because nobody ever tells us that. But so it shows to me that if I'm sitting on a bad day thinking, oh, I don't think this is really working, actually, I think it is working, but it's, it's kind of behind the scenes. So I think those are a, mainly our thing is this ability to convene. That's a really good point. You know, need to keep on reinforcing the messaging and give great examples and to encourage people to continue because in industrial biotech in particular it disappears into its destination sectors with healthcare you can go yes i'm measuring healthcare now but you're talking about food you're talking about textiles you're talking about fragrances you know you tend to have to go into the destination sector to try and measure it there's no common thing that goes yes this is industrial biotechnology so let's go, let's let's turn around back again towards the EFIB Vienna statement a little bit more once more and look at each of you ask each of you about one of the statements in the Vienna statement. So we had modernizing regulation and policy, we had education and awareness, and we had financing innovation. I'm going to jump back to Stefan now and say Stefan, where does Ebonic see some critical priorities linked to the uh, Vienna statement? I would go even beyond uh, Evonik and, and speak for our industry in general. You know, I think education is, is very crucial, yeah? uh, because uh, a good education, it's not, so, it's not really so much about our scientists or so, yeah? it's really about the public. Yeah? And we have to have more training in biotechnology at school, I would say. Yeah? We have to have more understanding. Yeah? And then we automatically will have less pressure on the, on the 
side of politics yeah, because the politicians in a democratic system, I mean, they follow the public. Yeah? And uh, if we have a high degree of acceptance with the public, um, then everything else will be uh, easier for us and will be on a more rational basis if there's a good education. And how important this is, you see, again, with the COVID crisis, yeah, you clearly see relationships. Yeah, You have higher incidences yeah, where vaccination rate is lower. Um, and typically, where the education is higher, yeah, um, you also have a higher vaccination rate. This is not a one-to-one -one relationship. Yeah, honestly speaking, even in our biotech team, we have one person who is not vac vaccinated. Yeah, um, but overall, yeah, this is what's true, and I think this is uh, very important. Yeah, and um, so we, I mean, also t talking about GMOs. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the opinions are changing. Yeah, but this should be based on an educated basis. Um, even uh, Simone Schmidt-Bauer, yeah, she, she talked about this uh, uh, GMO soya, yeah, which she doesn't want to have within the European Union, basically. Yeah. Um, is it really so bad? Yeah? Um, or are we hindering ourselves here? I, I'm not sure. And it's interesting to see that why people also in Germany don't want to have uh, meat from a cow, yeah, which has been fed with GMO soya. Um, those people are still considering uh, buying an impossible burger. Yeah, which is um, uh, which is produced from plant protein yeah, in combination with other uh, with a ham yeah, which has been produced um, by microorganism which is a micro uh, which is a GMO yeah. so their public opinion is changing different in different countries and I think um, that a good education will help us yeah, to develop also here in, in a more sustainable direction yeah, that we really that we really base our decisions on, on a rational basis, yeah, that we are going like with the science-based targets, yeah, that we really going for what scientifically makes sense. And I think this is the only way yeah, if you want to become sustainable on a world with, with 8 billion people. I think those are really interesting points. And it also brings me in mind of like the, the need to embrace all stakeholders in this, because I love the idea that fast food, but fast food companies, which are not my favorite things, um, will go, will make, if you can make something fashionable, if you can influence people's consumption and decision-making processes, then that's great. You know, a scientist standing in front of a room full of people is not going to make that persuasive argument, but name a large fast food company going we're going to make impossible burgers or we're going to make something else and people are going i'm going to buy one of those those are all the types of different routes through to people that we also need to make use of so that we normalize that this is this is a cool progressive thing it's not mm. it's not a threat towards your health or mm. sustainability of your country at all it's a way to move forward positively so I think I'll, I'll come back to Elka as well now, because um, again, we, we've stuck very strictly around the regulatory side from the BASF perspective. So I'm going to come back to you on that again. But from the regulatory side, yeah. from the um, the uh, Vienna statement, you know, where do you see the priority now? Yeah, of course, I pick the modernizing regulation and policy close to my heart and close to my daily daily work. Um, and I really see it uh, a little bit tragic as well, because with Horizon Europe and the EU Green Deal, the European Union has a worldwide most ambitious research and innovation funding program and the most ambitious policy framework for the green transformation. And at the same time, I mean, this is dedicated, of course, to solving some of the biggest societal challenges. And at the same time, we are investing in research, we are investing in innovation, and then products are stuck in the process. Uh, so it's really like to, to, and we see it again and again, that our most innovative products, I mean, not the old ones, which are known since ever. I mean, this you get through the system easily, but the new ones, they are stuck in the system for years because I don't know, the authorities sometimes have problems to sort it or what to do with that. And this really dense regulatory framework and this partly contradictory uh, DG objectives really helps, um, doesn't help. <laughs> and modern innovations needs agile and supportive regulatory and policy frameworks. It's not only about financing, it's really about supportive regulatory policy frameworks because we provide solutions to the objectives of the EU Commission, economic health and environmental health and, and personal health. So, and, and we see that innovations, and Jim, you mentioned it with US, but in other areas as well, 
the innovations are developed faster and faster outside Europe, inside Europe as well, but outside Europe, you get them much faster on the market. So this is again, Claire, what you said with customer or innovators. Do we want to be the customers of these kind of products? Even there, you need a regulatory approval or do you want to um, be the innovators yourselves? And I want to be the innovators myself. Very clear. Well, that's great. And, and then Jim, we come back to you for the last time on this question is, you mentioned financing earlier on. Yeah. Of course, money makes the world go round. So what are your priorities linked to uh, the financing side of things? Can I give you one minute in my hobby horse about education before I do that? You can. <laughs> because what, one of the things in education we've, we've discussed a lot is that almost always people come back to me and talk about PhDs. And I always say, look, guys, if you stick 200 PhDs in a factory, you'll get a million ideas a day, but you might not get any products. Because what you need is a workforce. If you work so hard in government and, and uh, industry working together to get to scale up, what happens if you don't have a workforce? So some of these, some of the ideas here are, are old. I believe that Germany was very successful in maintaining an apprenticeship system where other countries just junked it. And the old idea of a youngster, a 16 year old, who gets day release once a week to go to college to learn new skills and bring them back. Because let's face it, somebody with a PhD doesn't want to want to work in packaging, quality control, cold chain, but these are all things a workforce needs to do. So my, my point here is that the, the education has to go way, way beyond uh, PhDs. That's a tiny part of the, the, uh, the workforce. And I'm interested here to mention something a US colleague said to me once. He said, people think that the largest education system in the world is the University of California, but it's actually the California community college system. Now, the community colleges often are kind of almost broke, but here you could have this type of education being centered around there, taking pressure from universities to teach things that they don't want to teach. So I think this, this education thing, there are many ways we have to look at this, but we have to look to some of the things we've done in the past, as well as the new things of the future, like MOOCs. So that wasn't actually a one minute diversion. Let me get back to financing and let me give you an example. A few years ago, I was talking to staff at an Italian biorefinery. I won't mention names. Um, and they were talking about the, the problems they had financing the construction in Europe. And they had many different stages where they couldn't find the money easily. So it was a stop start type of operation with a lot of stress. And they said that the hardest aspect for financing was debt financing. And I said to them, you know, the USDA and the, the DOE offer loan guarantees to companies to do this. And they said loan guarantees would actually stop, would have removed a lot of that stop start, uh, which they faced because they would have future guarantees. Now, I'm not saying the loan guarantee is the be all and the end all of this. What I'm saying is hybrid financing systems, uh, but including things like loan guarantees. I think loan guarantees have come to Europe now, uh, but we, we have to look at, for example, for public money, not being wasted because let's face it governments are faced with not wasting taxpayers money but here i think the key phrase in financing especially for the private sector is risk mitigation because the private sector isn't going to shoulder this in its own and what what the public sector has to show is that it's ready to finance and it's in the long term to make this because let's face it this is a revolution that the the, the the public sector has to make that certainty because, of course, what companies in the, in the private sector sees is a political cycle of four or five years. And, and it's just as likely in the next political cycle, there's a U-turn and this is, a, this is unfashionable. And then you get what we call in the oil industry, stranded assets, money wasted, companies saying we can't go ahead with this in finance if we don't have the certainty. So in all the fancy things we talk about in policy, let me tell you what is one of the, the, the simplest and clearest messages we say to governments. Whatever the policy is, make sure it's consistent, make sure it's long term. And you have to get your head away from the idea of looking at the price of the oil barrel. The private sector can't do that, but I think the public sector can divorce itself and say, whatever you do, consistency and long term so that the private sector isn't scared to invest.
I think that's a really good point, especially when you look at it from a European level as well, when you've got 27 different EU countries that can also create a large scale stability of policy there. So it's not talking about one small country or even one large country like Germany. It's it's all the countries which enables that investment to be planned. And I really yeah. like your comment about the skills development as well, because having been involved in the biotech sector since the early 2000s and watched the private side of it really explode, every single aspect of the delivery of a product or a process is its own entire sector in its own right, whether you look at formulation, packaging, logistics, and all of them have very specific skills requirements. And you're right, if it was all run by people with PhDs, nothing would ever get finished. It certainly wouldn't get delivered. Um, <laughs> it's, it isn't, <laughs> it's, and this is perfect for Europe as well, because it needs to, it needs economic regeneration. It needs to bring all corners of Europe with it, you know, and you've got existing sectors now, which will not exist in 10 years time all yeah. will be radically different. So that yeah. the education and the skills development can be done and it's there to be done with a sector such as biotechnology. Yeah, well, if I can just, and I thought a minute on that is, I had the privilege a few years ago to peer through the doors of, uh, of Rolls-Royce Aero engines. And there you had apprentices, 16, 17, 18 year olds working with very, very high tech. Uh, and like CNC was a thing in the day. So they were doing very high tech work in those factories. And it reminded me of my education as a biologist. Like I said, it took me 10 minutes to learn how to prepare as an undergraduate. And I spent years and years just preparing. So one of my, it, my one of the things we've been saying about this <laughs> education thing is the education of the biologist, the biotechnologist will have to change radically to make it more like an engineering discipline rather than simply a science discipline. No, and I think that's uh, for another webinar, so uh, <laughs> which we could talk about all day, I would imagine. So I want to wrap up my questions to you. Why now? Is like just asking each of you if you could name one thing in the industrial biotech space that you would like to see change by the time we come together in Vilnius next year. What would it be? And I'll go back to Elke first. Now, I... <laughs> <laughs> okay. In one year, we won't get the regulatory system changed. But what I want to see is is uh, the, the establishment and starting and running of the sandboxing idea. Lovely. And I think this we can manage. Clear. Yes. We, we should. We should. It sounds very achievable. Stefan. Yeah, I think what we really should go for is the new GMO uh, legislation. Yeah, and uh, I would hope to see at least first steps next year. And Jim. Uh, I, I'd like real action on reform of fossil fuel consumption subsidies. And as I think Stefan mentioned earlier, uh, an explicit and real and realistic price on carbon. But I think for the industry, what I would love to see, and it's I don't think it's going to happen, is a blockbuster. Is getting away from the niche that you talked about. If if we could perfect bio-based ethylene or propylene, I don't think governments would ever worry about this again. Okay, so we've got three things to do. Uh, one of which involves a, a massive blockbuster. So I'm very happy to see that. Um, we've got one question coming in here that I just wanted to ask. That is, oh, Stefan, what did you want to yeah, ask? Yeah, perhaps, perhaps just one one more comment from my side. I mean, um, this topic of sustainability and biotechnology really is extremely important to us and and really to the to the ebonic management. Yeah, and we are having many ideas uh, which are realistic. I would say, yeah, and I'm, I'm surprised. I mean, how many ideas there are. But but they all depend basically on renewable feedstock. Yeah, it's it's really on the supplier side for us. Yeah, because we are a more specialty chemicals company, and and really the feedstock and and the energy, renewable energy problem. Yeah, these these are for me the the core problems. Yeah, the rest is more technology. Is this something we can solve? Yeah, there an easy uh, um, regulation can help. Yeah. No, that's great. So I'm. We've got one question in that I just wanted to pose. It's more of a philosophical question, really. You'll be delighted to know, and it's for Elka. Um, it's sort of about is it the really the role of the chemicals industry to lead the transition away from you know petrochemical derived processes into bio-based processes? Is this a transition that we expect the chemicals industry to be leading? 
Yeah, <laughs> we do. We do because because we are the only one who can do it. I mean, we have the markets, we have the value chains, and we have the knowledge because you need a lot of knowledge to do everything bio based. Um, so it's and we are actually doing it. I mean, we are on our way. I'm I'm part of the renewable raw material project at BSF, uh, leading the way to a renewable world in in BSF. Um, and it's not only renewable energy, we do a lot on that renewable energy front, getting away from gas, but as well to do a lot on the renewable raw material front to go away from fossil based chemistry. And I think it's, 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 a, it's a change for BSF and uh, I'm biologist and I'm not in the majority <laughs> at BSF. <laughs> there are a lot of chemists, of course. But it's still a polymer, even it's biochemistry. So I surely see that uh, the chemical industry is the one who should lead the way to a renewable based chemistry. Jim. Yeah, and presumably not just because it's the right thing to do, because it's an economic necessity. You want to stay competitive, so you have to stay in front. To to Jim. be part of the future. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, you look like you, look like yeah, you want to say I, something. I, I don't think it's in the interest of the oil companies, but more than anything, I have this in my head that the youngsters nowadays see the chemicals industry as old, dangerous, dirty, but I'll always say to them, the chemicals industry, as I know it, it makes about 70,000 different products. And the chemicals industry has always been the engine of innovation. So the chemicals industry is exactly where this has to be. And there is motivation because the, the, no, no matter what they think of it, it's old fashioned or whatever, the chemical industry never stands still. It's true. It's really true. And I think um, and on that note, I'm going to wrap up um, a really, really interesting panel discussion. So thank you so much. Uh, we've just about squeaked into time, although we could have gone on for much longer. So I'm going to ask Martina to put up our last slide for this afternoon so that I don't forget to say all my thank yous and goodbyes. So we would really like to thank all of our panelists today. Um, it, it's really great to look behind the scenes and look at the immense complexity and diversity around a transition to bio based products and processes. And this is all part of our work in Europa Bio towards our EFIB you know, community and conference. And we were very, very happy to be in Vienna, exceptionally happy to be in Vienna in October this year, which was one of the first times that we had come together all year. And we will be in Vilnius in Lithuania next year on the 26th and 27th of October. And we invite you all to come and join us there and help us build the EFIB Vilnius statement, which we will be publishing and debating and challenging people with after the event next year. So thank you once again for coming today. And thank you very much to our panelists for really brilliant inputs. So thank you very much. And you can go and get that cup of tea or that cup of coffee now. <laughs>